go. Welcome to this podcast, Women of the Northwest, where we interview ordinary women leading extraordinary lives. I'm your host, Jan Johnson, and I hope you'll enjoy hearing stories of what inspires women, what puts them in their happy place, and how they balance their lives, and some life-changing things that they've done. Today's guest is Amelia Fitch. She lives in currently in Vermont, and she's working on a doctorate that leads her to forest ecosystems. Good morning, Amelia. Good morning. Okay. And so this is going to be kind of exciting. I got to meet with you last week about uh, a possible scholarship. So um, that was kind of fun to get to hear the things that you're doing. That's uh, you're kind of an exciting person, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. And then I first knew you because you were working with my daughter, Sydney, at Fort Clatsop. Tell me a little bit some of the things that you did there. Yeah, at Fort Clatsop, we were on a trail crew, so building and maintaining trails um, about half the time. And then the other half of our time was spent um, trekking through the forest, looking for and, and pulling invasive species, sometimes on the, the creek as well. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun, a lot of time outdoors and um, definitely was one of the, one of my experiences that helped solidify that I was okay doing a lot of hard work outside and that a field work based career would be a good idea. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. I know that Sydney enjoyed herself and I had some maybe, uh, silly times and camaraderie and, uh, uh, friendships oh, that were oh, built yeah. along the way as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We always, we had a really good time. Yeah. Um, what about, um, so now currently, what are you passionate about? So uh, in terms of my kind of academic career side of things, I'm, I'm working on, like you said, a, a PhD that's going to lead me to forest ecosystems. So while I was at Fort Clatsop um, and we were helping out on some of the research or some of the, uh, excuse me, the restoration side of, of things, you know, restoring the wetlands and the slough that used to be pasture. Um, I got really interested in what was happening like with the sediment in the soil, because we were working a lot on plant communities and monitoring how plant communities were changing. And I, I wondered how that was affecting like carbon storage and the way nutrients were being cycled. Um, so that led me to, you know, pursuing, um, uh, research and a degree in, <clears throat> in ecology. And so right now I'm, I'm working in forest ecosystems in the Northeast. Um, I live in Vermont and um, I get to study how forests interact with microbes that live in the soil and vice versa. So things are above ground and below ground communities are interacting a lot and affecting a lot of things that we care about, like how soil stores carbon and how tree communities are, um, are changing and where, you know, where trees grow. Um, and what I really want to do with my degree, what I'm, what I'm passionate about to, to finally answer your question, um, is, is kind of applying all of this knowledge about how these ecosystems work and seeing or um, applying that to um, like forest management and the world of you know, the timber industry. And um, I guess a good way to put it is finding a balance between all these things we care about, you know, both having wood as a, a product, but also <clears throat> doing forest practices in the best way possible to, um, you know, protect and preserve wildlife, um, ecosystem processes, like the ones that I study, and um, figuring out how to um, balance all those, you know, those stakeholder needs. Do you think that there's anybody that would not benefit from your studies and this kind of a, you know, working towards balancing all of this? Can you say that one more time? There was a little bit of a lag. I wonder if there's anybody who would not benefit from oh. this. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Um, I, can't think of anything off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I feel like there are, you know, the forests provide so much in so many different ways. Yeah, they, because it's just so life-giving all the way around the world. It's not just locally. It's um, yeah, 
something that transfers your information to other things. What about um, when you started thinking about getting into this program, it, did it turn out to be like you thought it would be or has it been different? Um, you know, I, I think because I had a good taste of, of what research was like as an undergrad, I was, per, I thought I was, I thought I was prepared for graduate school it, in a lot of ways. I think some of the unexpected things, which also kind of ties into, um, you know, how I have persisted in, in getting a degree and, and sometimes a, like a, a challenge that I face. Um, so imposter syndrome is pretty widespread. I think a lot of people um, deal with imposter syndrome. And um, I think I didn't expect it to be something that I still felt in graduate school, you know, because as an undergrad, you think, okay, I'm, I'm so new to this. I'm just getting into it. Um, you know, you see other graduate students and they seem so smart and like knowledgeable and like, you know, the PIs are just like, have been doing this for decades or whatever. I could never and be that person. <laughs> I could never be that person. And then, and then I get to graduate school and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing the things and it's, it's going well, but I, you, it still, it doesn't go away. So it's kind of an active, you have to actively, um, or I have to actively, uh, I don't know what the best way to put it is, but I, I still think about sometimes, you know, oh, I'm, you know, not as good as this person, or I, you know, I'm not sure I can like do this academic career. And um, so it takes practice to set small goals and remind myself of the things that I have done and, and are currently doing that are cool. I think that's a, that goes for all kinds of stages of things. I feel the same way with my writing. It's like, am I really a writer or am I just somebody that, who thinks they might be able to fit into <laughs> something like this? But you just, sure, yeah, yeah. You just keep going. But I think it's um, what helps along the way is to have other maybe um, undergrads that see what you're doing and they think you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're the great and could they possibly attain to what you're doing? I, I do really enjoy working with undergrads. That's been a definite highlight of grad school is getting to work with <clears throat> people who are younger students and you know want to get into this kind of thing. And I can help them do that in, in a small way. Well, and I'm sure that your enthusiasm just is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> for what's there. I bet your parents are proud of you. Yeah, I think it's it's funny. It's come a little bit full circle because they're both foresters, and for a very long time, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do forestry. I'm not going to do the same thing that they do. And then, you know, here I am studying for, forest ecosystems, wanting to get in back into the or get into the forestry world. And um, anyway, it's kind of funny. But yeah, they're I think they're proud. <laughs> and do you see yourself staying on the East Coast? Are you going to come back to Oregon? I am going to come back to Oregon. I do really like living here. Vermont is awesome. I've made some really good friends and I'm, I bought a house and I'm fixing it up. And that's also been really fun um, and ch challenging. Uh, but I, I just feel drawn to the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, I, I, I love Oregon because I grew up there. And, um, but I would be happy to end up in, in Oregon or Washington. Um, you know, working on this kind of thing. I'm not totally sure if I will um, continue to pursue an academic track, but I know that I love doing research and I, I want to keep doing that and, you know, making the, the biggest impact that I can on, um, so, you know, sustainable forestry. So when you were in high school, uh, you went on a uh, trail up in uh, the rainforest, correct? Yes. Is that right. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So the I got to do this awesome program um, in the middle of high school for three weeks in North Cascades National Park, and it was this completely free program. I got to meet students um, from other places in the Pacific Northwest, um, and the, the program was centered on climate change and how. Uh, our ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest and specifically in kind of that North Cascades, um, you know, higher elevation places, how, how those ecosystems work, but also how they were changing already with climate change, which, you know, this was a decade ago. It was 
ooh, 11 years ago, actually. <laughs> was um, it that long ago? <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. Oh, man. Uh, but, but at that time, that was, it felt like a new concept. You know, it felt like, oh, like climate change affecting our ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest. Like, you know, this is such a haven for um, just, you know, the most amazing weather and seasons, whatever. Um, and, but they, but we were able to learn some really interesting things and, you know, look at glaciers and like how they've changed um, and talk, you know, talk to experts in their field about a lot of different things, fish, bears, glaciers. Um, and that was just so awesome. And I felt like, okay, you know, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, you know, I want to be like these people, um, you know, the graduate students who are, you know, leading the trip. I was just, they were just such great role models. Role models. Um, and so that definitely led me to pursuing research and, you know, going to study biology in college in the first place. Um, but it's, it's also interesting to think back about that and how, like I said, how new a concept it was that ch climate change was already affecting our, the places where we live. And, and now it's just like, it's, it's, you know, it's everywhere. It's every summer during fire season and, and for droughts and, um, yeah, anyway, kind of rambling, but I, I saw somebody <laughs> post a picture of Mount St. Helens with no snow on it. And apparently that's the first time in forever when yeah. there was no snow. I, I went to Mount Hood this year when I was visiting family and, and it looked so different from the years that I remember it just so, so little snow. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, the climate crisis is, is here. I mean, it's, it's been here for, for decades but now we're really feeling the effects that this kind of rolling ball um, was put into motion years and years and years ago. And now we're, we're feeling those effects. Um, it, you know, I don't think it's too late to, we, I mean, we don't really have any choice. We have to change things. And that's part of, part of the reason, well, a huge reason why I'm doing this kind of research is because, you know, across all of the things that we need to change, I want to help change or, you know, make forestry something that we can do sustainably mm -hmm. um, to both, you know, positively affect where our climate is going, um, but, you know, continue to, to give us a resource that is so much less potent in, in carbon emissions than other materials that we use, like, like concrete. I mean, it's, it's hard to see forests cut down like that's it feels like very personal sometimes and it, it even like hurts me to see that but it it helps for me to be a, a researcher in that and to know what goes on like almost directly after that and you know what happens even at the end of the season. So for example, I one of my research projects here in Vermont is understanding how after tracts of forest are cut, um, depending on what trees were growing there before, you know, what trees can we plant there that will do really well. So kind of thinking about like tree species shifting with climate change, but also invasive um, pests and, um, you know, fungi. There, there are several tree species that are on the way out here in, in the Northeast, um, ash and beech, and also possibly hemlock. So anyway, so we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, what's going to go on with these tree communities? And then long-term, like what, what is that going to do to the soil properties? But right now we're just tracking trees. So even from the forest being cut several months ago, um, and then we replanted, there's still a lot of natural regeneration. Um, and the other, the, the, um, the herbaceous communities, you know, the shrubs and the small plants that don't normally get that much sunlight, like they have just exploded ac across these plots. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool to see that happen so fast. Yeah. And I know I've been seeing like footprints of, deer um like browsing here and there throughout there because it's kind of an open meadow yeah. now it's it's just yeah it's really cool to see and i i know that there are a lot of flowers that i hadn't seen before and like i know those are good for pollinators so it's it's good to think about it for me as like a more um like longer term even on the scale of like a year you know right. um yeah. and anyway um kind of rambling but that's exciting um, yeah that's exciting yeah well, I was even as you're speaking, you know, thinking about the um, how this research could possibly benefit uh, the increase in dryness and forest fires and, you know, maybe replanting different ways or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, 
Definitely. There's, there's so many different ways that we need to kind of understand our, our forests, both in the context of how we use them, but also how our changing climate is going to affect them. So like wildfire, definitely like how we manage them, maybe use prescribed burn um, and maybe, you know, uneven age stand management. Um, so one actually just recently read a paper about uh, some, a research group who looked at how when you like cut forests, leaving certain, um, I forget their term that they called, but you know, just a, a bigger, older tree, like leaving that tree helped um, with like forest regeneration. It helped with um, like longer term carbon storage. So like even like very small changes like that can be really impactful for a regenerating forest community. And like some of those more, um, you know, like numbers that we're after, like increased carbon storage and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, on just playing devil's advocate when, because we have to think about, you know, both the research and like the ecosystem, but also on the production or extraction side of things, when you are taking, when you're thinning a forest and when you are maybe not necessarily clear cutting, but taking trees here and there or making smaller patches, you have to increase your roads. And so the impact from roads might go up. So all of these things, you know, needing to all be work taken together. In, yeah. all, they all work together and they also require a lot of different brains going into it. So one project that I'm super excited about that hopefully will become a reality is the Elliott State Research Forest in Oregon. So it's, it used to be well, it is, it is a public forest and it would continue to be a public forest. But the cool thing about this proposed project is that it would include, it has a, a, you know, an advisory committee that's made up of all kinds of different people from different backgrounds. Um, you know, American Indians, foresters, loggers, researchers, environmentalists from both like, you know, bird people, salmon people. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different brains have to come together to make this um, work. What a great collaboration. Hmm. Um, can you tell me a little bit of your vision of um, doing another hike or creating some kind of a hike for girls or? Oh, yeah. Teenagers? Yes. Yeah. I, so I mentioned the, um, the program that I got to do in high school um, <clears throat> in the North Cascades and how impactful that was for me. So I'm I'm hoping to help start something similar in Oregon. Um, I met a, another graduate student who started a program like this, and it's a, a backpacking program where you learn, where students learn about ecology around them. And she started this program in North Carolina and then helped other graduate student groups start similar programs in New Mexico and California. And when I heard her give a research talk and then also talk about this work that she had done, um, starting this outreach program, I was like, oh man, like this is very similar to what I did as a, a high school student. And here I am, like I could do this too on, you know, in the graduate student shoes. So um, I am still looking for a source of funding. It's very hard to apply for grants if you are not a nonprofit or don't have access to a nonprofit like tax number. Um, so I either have to start my own nonprofit or um, find a funder who would be interested in that kind of work. How much do you think it would cost to do that kind of a program? The first year, I think it would cost five to six thousand dollars, depending on if I could have gear also donated. I think that's, that's like true. on the yeah, it yeah. sounds like that's attainable. That's not yeah. really out of the realm, like 30,000 no. to start. No, and I, I had like, I made a budget. I made, like, I have my own kind of like lesson ideas. Um, but I also have access to this. This graduate student is like totally open to like working with anyone who wants to start something similar. So it's, it's like a nice support network already. Um, and, oh, I wanted to mention, like, I think the the best thing that could come out of this project is, you know, it, it's for it's for women and students who are gender nonconforming, um, and you know, just to help those kinds of students, like you know, get into um, this kind of research because academia is still a lot more male dominated. Um, anyway, but I, I think it would be. Um, oh, what was I going to say? 
Oh yeah, part of the program would be students doing their own mini research project, which is so important for, um, you know, just like building confidence and like working together and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, is it, would it be possible for me to put um, contact for you in case somebody listening here would like yeah. to support that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Tell me, uh, what are you doing for fun? Besides, you know, this work that's fun. I know that's fun. That's your yeah. of your life. But what other kind of things do you do? What hobbies or activities do you like to do? Sure. Um, well, when I moved to Vermont, I adopted a dog. So he goes on lots of adventures um, with me and my partner. Um, but one of the things that he loves, well, one of the many things he loves is going mountain biking. So we've been we've been training him the last couple of summers to be you know, a good mountain bike dog, you know, not to get in front of the bike, um, cause he could get run over, uh, you know, but that's, so that's been really fun to see him kind of come into that and, and learn and grow and, um, go with us on mountain biking adventures. And what type um, of dog? Is I he? also love to bake with sourdough and, and oh, sorry, we got a lad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> what type of dog, dog is it? He, he's a cattle dog. His name's Waldo. Uh, named after Waldo Lake in Oregon, uh, but it's also an, it's just like a good name because anyone can connect with that with that name. Exactly. Yeah, where's Waldo? And you like to bake? I like to bake, and and Jan, I don't know if you remember this, but you were the first person to give me sourdough starter when I was in college, <laughs> and I I tried it out a little then, and, and that particular starter didn't last, you know, till now. It didn't last those years, but I got back into it when I started this graduate program, and it's it was a real, it was really fun. It was a good distraction during the pandemic to, to kind of lean into the sourdough and try all kinds of new recipes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Baking is always fun. I just, yeah, uh, because there's always a reward at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, a good, it's, it's kind of a, a little love language. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good to give to friends and um, really nice to bring to potlucks or, or get togethers. Right. Yeah. Do you have any uh, travel plans or, well, uh, I guess pandemic considering. <laughs> pandemic considering I, I am supposed to fly back to Oregon for a wedding um, Labor Day weekend. So it's going to be outdoors, which is good. It's going to be, it's a, it's camping on this couple's, uh, Buffalo farm actually. Oh, um, so, and they, they have other things too. We helped them plant their apple orchard and their hazelnut orchard years ago. So it'll be, yeah. it'll be a good reunion, but you know, um, it's looking a little dicey out there, but if that, if it does look like we can go, um, which I think we can, we're also going to sneak in a backpacking trip, um, depending on where the smoke is hoping to go to the Wallawas or maybe back up to the North Cascades. We're not sure yet. Sounds like fun. Emily just did a wedding this weekend and it was outdoors. It was a little drizzly, but it was uh, yeah. great. They camped and all of that too. So it was really fun. Yeah. Did cool. some uh, kayaking together and well, that was fun. All oh, right, awesome. Emily, uh, Amelia, I'm gonna just thank you so much for sharing who you are and with oh, us thank it's you inspiring and uh, I wish you the best in what you're doing oh thanks Jen it was good to see you too okay bye bye <laughs>